I'm going to be preaching what my wife told me is the best sermon I ever preached, and that's not saying much, but um, I preached on, I preached through the book of Genesis uh, some years ago, it's, uh, it's probably been five or six years now, I believe, and I preached verse by verse through the entire book of Genesis, and when I came to the, the flood of Noah, um, I had many people tell me, actually, that that was my best sermon, uh, and it's not so much about my sermon, but the way the story impacts us. And one of the things that I hope you begun to see last week, and I really want you to see this week, is that we miss the point of this story so often. I think many people, when they read this story, or when they think of the flood of Noah, they don't think of what the story is really about. I could have entitled the sermon this morning, The Scariest Story in the Bible. But then I started thinking about that, and really it's the second scariest story in the Bible, because the scariest story is in Revelation chapter 20, where we are told about the lake of fire and what eternal hell will be like. That is the scariest story in the Bible. But it's interesting because when Jesus and the Apostle Peter wanted to express to us how awful hell would be, do you know what they compared hell to? The flood of Noah. In 2 Peter chapter 3, and as we read this morning in Matthew chapter 24, when the Bible needs to help us understand how awful the lake of fire is, and eternal punishment will be for those who are not in Christ. This story of the flood of Noah's day is the illustration and the comparison that is drawn. It is truly the second scariest story in the Bible, but that doesn't make a good title. And so the title of the sermon this morning is A Righteous Man in a Corrupt Generation. The, the passage is going to show us Noah and his family in contrast to the corrupt generation of his day. Last week I told you that we cover a tremendous amount of history in the first six chapters of the Bible. In fact, as we come to Noah's day and the flood, which will happen in the 600th year of Noah's life, which we'll read this morning, If you date that back with Genesis 5 and the genealogy that's given there, you're told how many years came between each generation that led to Noah. And if you add up the years, the flood comes exactly 1,656 years after God made Adam. So from the creation of Adam to the flood is 1,656 years, and that's a lot of time that's being covered in just six chapters. And the picture that we got last week is that as man profaned marriage, and if you want to understand what I'm saying, I encourage you to to go online, watch the sermon from last week if you haven't heard it, uh, because I don't have time to go back through the explanation of what's going on in the first eight verses of chapter 6, but what the conclusion that we reached was that the children of God, the descendants of Seth, began to marry those who were not believers and their children and grandchildren and every generation after was disobedient to the Lord to the point where with each generation things got worse and worse and worse And now we have reached a time in Noah's day, 1656 years after God made Adam, where things are so bad that God says, that's it, I have to destroy everyone and everything on the earth. And we came to verse 7 of chapter 6 where God said, I will blot out man whom I have created from the face of the land, man and animals and creeping things, and the birds of the heavens, for I am sorry that I have made them. God says, This creation has been going for over a millennia and a half and I'm about to destroy it because that's how corrupt the people have become. In verse 8 we read, 
But Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. There is one man in this corrupt generation whom God decides to save along with his wife, his three sons, and their wives. So eight people God saves in a world of presumably millions of corrupt sinners. Genesis chapter 6 verse 9, we continue to read the story this morning. These are the generations of Noah. Noah was a righteous man, blameless in all his generation. Noah walked with God. I have to stop there and explain what is being said. Noah is a righteous man. We will find out later in the book of Genesis chapter 15 verse 6 that a way that a man becomes righteous is by belief or by faith in the Lord. It says in Genesis 15 verse 6 that Noah believed the Lord and he counted his belief, his faith to him as righteousness. Noah was a righteous man, blameless before God, but the reason he was blameless was not because he wasn't a sinner. All you have to do is read later in the life of Noah in Genesis chapter 9, a very embarrassing story about when Noah gets drunk and does some very foolish things that I won't mention, but just read the story at the end of Genesis 9, and you can see that he was not a perfect man. He was a sinner just like you and I. But he was a man of faith. He was a man who followed the Lord. He was a godly man. Albeit imperfect, Noah walked with the Lord. He walked with God. And that was also true of Enoch in chapter 5. Enoch walked with God and God allowed Enoch to be spared of death and he caught him up to heaven. Enoch and Elijah are the only two men in the Bible that God did not allow to experience an earthly physical death. And so a man who walks with God is a man of faith in God. A person who is a sinner, but is a sinner who has received grace and forgiveness for their sins. What we simply today would call a Christian, a true Christian, a real Christian, a person who practices what they preach and who walks what they talk. Noah walked with God, verse 10, and Noah had three sons, Shem, Ham, and Japheth. Three sons, Shem, Ham, and Japheth. And each of these sons, we will read, had a wife. So Noah, his wife, his three sons, and their wives. That is Noah's family. Verse 11, now the earth was corrupt in God's sight. We were just told how Noah and his sons were righteous and walked with the Lord, but they were the only godly family on the whole planet. You think it's hard today to find a Bible-believing Christian in this culture? You feel alone today. Noah and his family really were the only ones. That's not an exaggeration. They were the only ones who trusted the Lord on the whole planet. Imagine how that must have felt. The earth was corrupt in God's sight, and the earth was filled with violence. Verse 12, And God saw the earth, and behold, it was corrupt, for all flesh had corrupted their way on the earth. Man had made things so bad that God looked at his creation with disgust and realized how corrupted and tarnished it had become. God made this world perfect and now it was full of evil. And our sin is offensive to a holy and righteous God. And God looked down at this earth and all the wickedness upon it and he saw how corrupt it was. And God was offended. And God was angry. Today we hear little talk of the wrath of God. The word wrath simply means God's anger towards sin and the sinner. And yes, God is angry both at our sin and at the sinner. If you don't believe that, then why does it say in Ephesians chapter 2, that we, before we knew Christ, were objects of God's wrath. 
not just our sin, but we were objects of God's wrath. God's anger was directed toward us before we came to faith in Christ. Verse 13, as God looks out on the earth and how corrupt it is, God speaks to Noah. And now God is going to fill Noah in on what he is about to do. Remember from last week, we read in verse 3 that in 120 years, God had decided to flood the earth. And now God speaks to Noah, and he's got 120 years to build the biggest boat ever (laughs) and get ready. So verse 13, God said to Noah, I have determined to make an end of all flesh, for the earth is filled with violence through them. Behold, I will destroy them with the earth. God says, I'm going to kill everyone on the earth. Get ready, Noah. I'm going to destroy the earth and all the people and the animals upon it. Verse 14, make yourself an ark of gopher wood. Interesting little fact here. The word ark in Hebrew literally means a box. And so I guess the ark was more or less box shaped. You'll read the dimensions in a moment. And it seems to be this giant rectangle. And so anyways, it was an ark or literally a box of gopher wood. We don't really know what kind of wood that was, but it was probably the best to build a boat with, especially one of this size. Verse 14 continuing, make room in the ark and cover it inside and out with pitch. This would be a a mortar type material that would make it waterproof, that it would have no leaks. Verse 15, this is how you are to make it. The length of the ark, 300 cubits, its breadth, 50 cubits, and its height, 30 cubits. A cubit is a foot and a half, 18 inches. This ark is huge. 450 feet long, 75 feet wide, 45 feet high. It's massive. Verse 16, make a roof for the ark and finish it to a cubit above and set the door of the ark in its side. Make it with lower, second, and third decks. There will be three floors inside the ark. Verse 17, for behold... I will bring a flood of waters upon the earth to destroy all flesh in which is the breath of life under heaven. Everything that is on the earth shall die. Don't just read past this verse. Verse 17 says, I will bring a flood of waters upon the earth to destroy all flesh in which is the breath of life under heaven. Everything that is on the earth shall die. And you can hear God's heartache when he says this. God takes no pleasure in the destruction of the wicked, the scriptures tell us. God does not delight in in doing this. It's not like he had fun when he flooded the earth. He did it because he had to. He did it because his justice and his righteousness demanded it. And he had to put an end to the evil. It was so bad, God had to put a stop to it. as has been in the news recently, our president feels that we need to apologize for dropping the atom bomb on Hiroshima and Nagasaki. Listen, the way World War, ended, World War II ended was awful, but it was necessary. And by doing what we did, we spared more lives than we had to take. And the fact of the matter is, is that when things get this bad, there are no easy solutions. Why is hell necessary? Because that's how corrupt and evil the heart of man is. And that is what our sin deserves. Sometimes things are so bad, the solution is terrible. And there is no easy way out. And that is the situation that God was faced with when he said... Everything that is on the earth shall die. Verse 18. But I will establish my covenant with you, Noah, 
and you shall come into the ark, you, your sons, your wife, and your sons' wives. And didn't Noah have to think, God, why me? Why me and my family and us only? What about everyone else? What about the thousands of people living around me? What about all these others? Take them all. I'm sure Noah felt humbled by this. I'm sure that Noah realized when God said this that he meant what he said and that God was literally going to destroy everyone and everything he had ever known except for his family. That there would be absolutely nothing left of all that he had known for the first 600 years of his life. And yes, Noah lived as long as the Bible says. How do I know that? Because God said so and God doesn't lie. Anyways, he says, I will establish my covenant with you, verse 19, and of every living thing of all flesh you shall bring two of every sort into the ark to keep them alive with you. They shall be male and female. Of the birds according to their kinds, and of the animals according to their kinds, of the creeping thing of the ground according to its kind, two of every sort shall come in to keep them alive. Also take with you every sort of food that is eaten and store it up. It shall serve as food for you and for them. Noah did this. He did all that God commanded him. God says build the ark. When you build it, put animals on it. And he says put the animals each according to its kind. This word in Hebrew translated here according to their kind. This word is basically the equivalent of the scientific classification of family. When I was in high school, actually it was sixth grade, I had to learn the scientific classifications, the seven levels of scientific classification. Kingdom, phylum, class, order, family, genus, species. And I've not forgotten it since because my teacher made us repeat it hundreds of times until it was seared into our brain. Kingdom, phylum, class, order, family, then genus and species. People say, well, you think God got every species of animal on the earth into that ark? No, that's not what the Bible says. According to their kinds. And the Hebrew word here is essentially the equivalent of a kind. The family, the kind, would be like two of every dog, two of every cow, two of every horse. Not every breed of dog and every breed of cow and every breed of horse, but two horses, two cows, and then we'll see for the clean animals seven pairs of each of those. It's not as many animals as some people make it out to be. It's still thousands of animals, but it's not as unreasonable as some might think. And some people just want to dismiss this as if it couldn't possibly be historically true. Well, that's fine if you believe that God is a liar. But I, for one, believe that when God said that this is what Noah should do and it's recorded in the Bible as something that actually took place in time and history, I believe that when God speaks, his word is true and he never lies. And I believe exactly what the Bible says happened, happened. It's just that simple. And we'll read in a moment about the flood, but many people today say it, it couldn't have been a worldwide flood. God couldn't have flood. It was a local flood. God flooded an area. Three problems with that. Number one, if God wasn't going to flood the whole earth, why did animals need to get on the ark? If he was just going to flood one continent or, or, you know, one area of the planet, wouldn't the animals on the other part of the planet have lived? There'd have been no need for the ark to be so big. Could have just got a little small boat for Noah and his family and that would have been enough. No, all the animals got on the ark because God flooded the whole earth. Number two. If this is not true, then God is a liar. Because we will read in a moment that the waters covered the whole earth. It covered the mountains. It covered everything under the sky. There was nothing but water on the earth. So another reason why this must be true is because God said he flooded the whole earth. And if he didn't flood the whole earth, that would make God a liar. And number three... As we look at this story, it was necessary for the ark. God is not a liar. 
And as we look at the story, also think of this. God said he would never flood the whole earth again. He would never have a flood like in the day of Noah ever again. If it was merely a local flood, well, guess what? God broke his promise a couple months ago when Grant Parish flooded. Think about it. That was a local flood. There have been local floods throughout history since this time, but there will never be a flood like the one in Noah's day ever again. And so those who deny that it was a global worldwide flood are just simply trying to get out of what the Bible so plainly says. There's just no other way to state it. Chapter 7, verse 1, we see the flood waters begin to fall. Then the Lord said to Noah, Go into the ark, you and all your household. For I have seen that you are righteous before me in this generation. Take with you seven pairs of all clean animals, the male and his mate, a pair of the animals that are not clean, the male and his mate, and seven pairs of the birds of the heavens, male and female, to keep their offspring alive on the face of all the earth. For in seven days I will send rain on the earth, forty days and forty nights, and every living thing that I have made I will blot out from the face of the ground. And Noah did all that the Lord had commanded him. Noah was not only a man of faith, but because of his faith in the Lord, he obeyed the Lord and did all that the Lord commanded him. He built the ark. And we are told in 2 Peter uh, chapter 3, as well as in 1 Peter chapter 3, we are told that when Noah built the ark, that the, he preached righteousness to the people around him. Second Peter chapter 2, verse 5 says that Noah was a preacher of righteousness. He did warn others around him, God is going to flood the earth, get on the ark with me and God will save you. And no one listened. Jesus says that when the Son of Man comes back, it will be like in the days of Noah. When Noah was there building the ark and no one wanted to listen, they were marrying and drinking and giving in marriage and they were partying and have a good time and they didn't want to listen to God's prophet, God's preacher say, God is going to destroy the earth, help me and get on the ark with me. No one wanted to hear the word of God until it was too late. It's not that Noah kept this a secret. It's that no one wanted to listen. And I know that today it seems like no one wants to listen. But there was one man on the earth preaching the truth. And everyone else except for that man and his family didn't believe it. Eight people believed, millions didn't believe, and guess who was right? The one whom heard from the mouth of God. And today, ladies and gentlemen, we have a certain and sure word from the mouth of God. And I don't care how few believe and how many disbelieve, the word of God is true. And just like in the days of Noah, what God has said will come to pass and we will preach that there is salvation in no one but Jesus Christ and that we should flee to him and that our ark today which will save us is the cross of Jesus Christ and his empty tomb and we will plead with men and women to go into that ark to cling to that cross to run to Jesus Christ Peter in, in 1 Peter chapter 3 makes a direct connection between the ark of Noah and the cross of Christ. And he says just like Noah was saved from the waters of the flood by the ark, so too we are saved through the cross of Jesus Christ, through the death he died to pay for our sins and his resurrection from the grave. Noah warned people, but no one listened. So if you feel the same today, you're in good company. Noah did all the Lord commanded him. Verse 6. Noah was 600 years old when the flood of waters came upon the earth. And you just say this. If Noah built this great boat with his family, I believe that before the flood, that people obviously did not age as quickly as they do today. I don't know anybody today who's 600 years old. But Noah lived 600 years. And yes, a year in his day was the same as a year in our day. Moses, who wrote this, had the, had the same understanding of a year. For him, a year would have been 
more exactly 360 days. The Jewish calendar was slightly different than ours, but nonetheless, a year is a year. And so Noah was actually 600 years old, but no, I don't think he aged as quickly as we do today. But when he was 600 years old, the flood of waters came upon the earth. Verse 7, And Noah and his sons and his wife and his sons' wives went with him into the ark to escape the waters of the floods. Eight people get on the ark. Everyone else doesn't listen. They stay outside. That Jesus says they were drinking. They were partying. They were marrying. They were giving in marriage. They were doing whatever they wanted to. And they laughed at Noah and ridiculed Noah, a preacher of righteousness, while he and his family of eight get on the boat. Verse 8, also getting on the boat, we read of clean animals and of animals that are not clean and of birds and of everything that creeps on the ground, two and two, male and female, went into the ark with Noah as God had commanded Noah. And after seven days, the waters of the flood came upon the earth. God gave them seven days to get all that on the boat, and they did. Verse 11. In the 600th year of Noah's life, in the second month, on the 17th day of the month, on that day, all the fountains of the great deep burst forth and the windows of the heavens were open. Why the specific day? In the 600th year of Noah's life, on the second month, on the 17th day of the month, on that day, God sent the flood upon the earth because it was a day that Noah and his family would never forget. It was seared into their memory. And every time they would tell the story to their children and their children's children and every generation that would follow, they remembered that day. It's like September 11th, 2001. We can't forget that day. It is seared into our minds. If we live through it, we'll never forget it. And for Noah and his family, the day when God flooded the earth and killed everyone and everything except for Noah and his family and the animals that got with them onto the ark, that is a day that, believe me, no matter how many hundreds of years they would live, they would never forget that day. Verse 12 And the rain fell upon the earth 40 days and 40 nights. And and imagine just the hardest rain you, you could possibly have. Just can't see your hand in front of your face. Just a pouring rain constantly around the clock for 40 days and 40 nights. And the rain fell upon the earth 40 days and 40 nights. Verse 13, on the very same day, Noah and his sons, Shem, Ham, and Japheth, and Noah's wife, and the three wives of his sons with them entered the ark. They and every beast, according to its kind, all the livestock, according to their kinds, every creeping thing that creeps on the earth, according to its kind, every bird, according to its kind, and every winged creature. They went into the ark with Noah, two and two of all flesh, in which there was the breath of life, and those that entered, male and female of all flesh, went in as God commanded him, and the Lord shut him in. How was the door closed? God closed the door. The Lord shut them in and he shut everyone else out. Verse 17. The flood continued 40 days on the earth. The waters increased and bore up the ark and it rose high above the earth. The waters prevailed and increased greatly on the earth and the ark floated on the face of the waters. And you ask the question, where does the Bible say that it was a global flood, that the whole earth was flooded? Right here. Look at verse 19. And the waters prevailed so mightily on the earth that all the high mountains under the whole heaven were covered. The waters prevailed above all the mountains, covering them 15 cubits deep, 22 and a half feet deep, above the tallest mountain on the earth. And all flesh died that moved on the earth, birds, livestock, beasts, all swarming creatures that swarm on the earth, and all mankind, everything on the dry land in whose nostrils was the breath of life, died. 
He blotted out every living thing that was on the face of the ground. Man and animals and creeping things and birds of the heaven. They were blotted out from the earth and Noah was left only. And those who were with him in the ark. And the waters prevailed on the earth 150 days. This really is the second scariest story in the Bible next to the lake of fire. And you might be asking the question now, well, gosh, why, why should we teach this story to our kids this week at VBS? Maybe we should teach them something happier. Our kids need to know. They need to know that there is punishment for sin and only one way of salvation. God didn't make two arcs. He had no make one. There's only one way of salvation and you better get on the boat. I have a few slides that I'd like to show you now. It's how we typically think of the flood. We tell the story to our kids and it's a cute little children's story. And we, uh, we got Noah there and he's hanging out, you know, and he's, he's having a good time in the ark with all the animals and it's very cute. But I think that when we tell the story, we don't do it justice because this is what it was really like. As the waters fell on the earth, there were people outside who were no doubt beating on the side of the ark. They were drowning. They were going under the water. I'm sure that some went to the highest ground that they could find until finally that ground was covered as the Bible told us 15 cubits deep. And the water remained 150 days above the highest mountain. Meaning, you can't swim that long. Everyone drowned. That is what really happened when God flooded the earth. And I pray that you would never look at this story the same way again. Let's finish the story in Genesis 8 verse 1. After God did all this, we read, But God remembered Noah and all the beasts and all the livestock that were with him in the ark. And God made a wind blow over the earth, and the water subsided. The fountains of the deep and the windows of the heaven were closed, and the rain from the heavens was restrained, and the water receded from the earth continually. And at the end of 150 days, the waters had abated. And in the seventh month, on the 17th day of the month, the ark came to rest on the mountains of Ararat. And the waters continued to abate until the 10th month. And in the 10th month, on the first day of the month, the tops of the mountains were seen. Verse 6, And at the end of 40 days, Noah opened the window of the ark that he had made, and he sent forth a raven. It went to and fro until the waters had dried up on the earth. Then he sent forth a dove from him to see if the waters had subsided from the face of the ground. But the dove found no place to set her foot, and she returned to him on the ark. For the waters were still on the face of the whole earth. So he put out his hand and took her and brought her into the ark with him. And he waited another seven days, and again he sent forth the dove out of the ark. And the dove came back to him in the evening, and behold, in her mouth was a freshly plucked olive leaf. New life. God has restored life to the earth that he had destroyed. So Noah knew that the waters had subsided from the earth. Then he waited another seven days and sent forth the dove, and she did not return to him any more. She had found solid ground, and Noah knew that it was time to get off of the ark. Verse 13, In the six hundred and first year, in the first month, on the first day of the month, the waters were dried, were dried from off the earth. And Noah removed the covering of the ark and looked, and behold, the face of the ground was dry. In the second month, on the 27th day of the month, the earth had dried out. And then God said to Noah, Go out from the ark, you and your wife, and your sons and your sons' wives with you. 
Bring out with you every living thing that is with you of all flesh, birds and animals, and every creeping thing that creeps on the earth, that they may swarm on the earth and be fruitful and multiply on the earth. God is essentially having a a, a new creation here, like in Genesis 1, where God told Adam and Eve to be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth. God is starting over with Noah and his family. Verse 18, And Noah went out, and his sons and his wife and his sons' wives with him, every beast, every creeping thing, and every bird, everything that moves on the earth, went out by families from the ark. Now, ladies and gentlemen, we will come back next week and see the covenant that God made with Noah after they get off the ark. But let me say this before we close this chapter this morning. Why is it that we so often get the story of the flood wrong? We think of it as a nice, cute children's story. It is a children's story. We should tell it to our children, but it's not nice and it's not cute. It's awful. It's terrible. But it also speaks of God's grace to those who trust him. It speaks of one way of salvation that God provides for his people. You see, the reason we get the story wrong and we forget about the terror of it all is because we don't rightly understand the wrath of God against sin and the sinner. We don't understand that God is angry with sin. We don't understand that if we do not turn to God, if we do not repent of our sins and place our faith in Christ, that judgment awaits us. And Jesus says, when I come back, it will be like in Noah's day. Most people are not going to be listening They're going to be doing their own thing, living their own life. And the waters will sweep them all away. Peter says God flooded the the, the earth with water once. And God will never flood the earth with water again. But there is coming a day when God will flood the earth with fire. And Peter says, and the heavens and the earth and everything in them will be dissolved with fire. Therefore, what sort of persons ought you to be? And that is the question I ask you this morning. Now that you see God's wrath towards sin and the grace that is offered to anyone who will get on the ark, who will run to Jesus Christ, who will turn from their sin and place their faith in the only way of salvation, what are you going to do? Are you going to be like Noah? And his family, are you going along with the crowd? Is it going to be the narrow gate and the narrow path? Or the broad gate and the broad path? This is serious business, ladies and gentlemen. And my plea to you this morning is don't, don't stop thinking about this. Don't let this go until you know that you're on the ark, that you've come to Christ, that you are saved, that you're covered with his blood, that the death he died on the cross was in your place to pay for your sins, and you've trusted and received forgiveness. You've given your life to Jesus, and you were saved. Don't go home today without having certainty in your heart that you know Christ. Because you don't know when the flood comes. But once it comes, it will be too late. So trust in him now while you still have time. What a gracious God. He didn't have to provide them with an ark. He could have drowned Noah and his family as well. And he would have been perfectly just and righteous to do so. But God is gracious. And he provides salvation to those who trust in him. And he offers that salvation to you today. What a fool we would be to turn away and not go into the ark and be saved. Let's pray. Father, we come this morning, Lord, and I just plead with you now that, Lord, I know there are almost certainly some among us today who've never repented of their sins and trusted in Christ. And God, how I plead that you would 
that you would change their heart today, that you'd give them a new heart, that you'd grant them your Holy Spirit, that they would run to Jesus and be saved. God, may we all know with certainty that we are in Christ, that we are covered by his blood, and that our salvation is secure. If there's one here today who does not know Christ in this way, God, how I plead that you would move in their heart now, that they would come before this church, and that they would make it known that today they're ready to surrender everything to Jesus. In the name of Jesus we pray. Amen. If you need to come